Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. The Prologue. Enter Chorus. Chorus. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love, and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end not could remove, is now the two hours' traffic of our stage. The which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall have strive to mend. Exit. Act One, Scene One, Verona, a public place. Enter Samson and Gregory, with swords and bucklers, of the house of Capulet. Samson. Gregory, on my word, will not carry coals. Gregory. No, for then we should be colliers. Samson. I mean, and we be in coller, will draw. Gregory. Ay, while you live, draw your neck out of a collar. Samson. I strike quickly, being moved. Gregory. But thou art not quickly moved to strike. Samson. A dog of the house of Montague moves me. Gregory. To move is to stir, and to be valiant is to stand. Therefore, if thou art moved, thou runnest away. Samson. A dog of that house shall move me to stand. I will take the wall of any man or maid of Montague's. Gregory. That shows thee a weak slave, for the weakest goes to the wall. Samson. Tis true, and therefore women being the weaker vessels are ever thrust to the wall. Therefore I will push Montague's men from the wall, and thrust his maids to the wall. Gregory. The quarrel is between our masters and us their men. Samson. Tis all one. I will show myself a tyrant when I have fought with the men. I will be cruel with the maids. I will cut off their heads. Gregory. The heads of the maids. Samson. Ay, the heads of the maids, or their maiden heads. Take it in what sense thou wilt. Gregory. They must take it in the sense that feel it. Samson. Me they shall feel while I am able to stand, and tis known I am a pretty piece of flesh. Gregory. Tis well thou art not fish. If thou hadst, thou hadst been poor John. Draw thy tool. Here comes two of the house of Montague's. Enter two other serving men, Abram and Balthazar. Samson. My naked weapon is out. Quarrel. I will back thee. Gregory. How? Turn thy back and run? Samson. Fear me not. Gregory. No, Mary, I fear thee. Samson. Let us take the law of our sides. Let them begin. Gregory. I will frown as I pass by, and let them take it as they list. Samson. Nay, as they dare, I will bite my thumb at them, which is disgrace to them, if they bear it. Abram. Do you bite your thumb at us, sir? Samson. I do bite my thumb, sir. Abram, do you bite your thumb at us, sir? Samson, aside to Gregory. Is the law of our side if I say I? Gregory, aside to Samson. No. Samson. No, sir, I do not bite my thumb at you, sir, but I bite my thumb, sir. Gregory. Do you quarrel, sir? Abram. Quarrel, sir? No, sir. Samson. But if you do, sir, am for you, I serve as good a man as you. 
Abram. No better. Samson. Well, sir. Enter Benvolio. Gregory, aside to Samson. Say better. Here comes one of my master's kinsmen. Samson. Yes, better, sir. Abram. You lie. Samson. Draw, if you be men. Gregory, remember thy swashing blow. They fight. Benvolio. Part, fools! Beats down their swords. Put up your swords. You know not what you do. Enter Tybalt. Tybalt. What art thou drawn among these heartless hinds? Turn thee, Benvolio. Look upon thy death. Benvolio. I do but keep the peace. Put up thy sword or manage it to part these men with me. Tybalt. What, drawn and talk of peace? I hate the word, as I hate hell, all Montagues, and thee. Have at thee, coward! They fight. Enter an officer, and three or four citizens with clubs or partisans. Officer. Clubs, bills, and partisans! Strike! Beat them down! Citizens. Down with the Capulets, down with the Montagues. Enter old Capulet in his gown, and his wife. Capulet. What noise is this? Give me my long sword. Ho! Wife. A crutch, a crutch. Why call you for a sword? Capulet. My sword, I say. Old Montague is come, and flourishes his blade in spite of me. Enter old Montague and his wife. Montague, thou villain Capulet, hold me not, let me go. Montague's wife, thou shalt not stir one foot to seek a foe. Enter Prince Aeschylus with his train. Prince, rebellious subjects, enemies to peace, profaners of this neighbor, stained steel, will they not hear? What, ho, you men, you beasts, that quench the fire of your pernicious rage with purple fountains issuing from your veins. O pain of torture from those bloody hands, throw your mistempered weapons to the ground and hear the sentence of your moved prince. Three civil brawls bred of an airy word by thee, old Capulet and Montague, have thrice disturbed the quiet of our streets and made Verona's ancient citizens cast by their grave the seeming ornaments to wield old partisans, and hands as old, cankered with peace, depart your cankered hate. If ever you disturb our streets again, your lives shall pay the forfeit of the peace. For this time all the rest depart away. You, Capulet, shall go along with me, and Montague, come you this afternoon to know our farther pleasure in this case, to old Freetown, our common judgment place. Once more, on pain of death, all men depart. Exunt. All but Montague, his wife, and Benvolio. Montague. Who set this ancient quarrel new abroach? Speak, nephew, were you by when it began? Benvolio. Here were the servants of your adversary, and yours, close fighting ere I did approach. I drew to part them. In the instant came the fiery Tybalt with his sword prepared, which, as he breathed defiance to my ears, he swung about his head and cut the winds, who, nothing hurt withal, hissed him in scorn, while we were interchanging thrusts and blows came more and more, and fought on part and part, till the prince came, who parted either part. Montague's wife. Oh, where is Romeo? Saw you him to-day? Right glad I am, he was not at this fray. Benvolio. Madam, an hour before the worshipped sun peered forth the golden window of the east, a troubled mind drave me to walk abroad where underneath the grove of sycamore that westward rooteth from the city's side, so early walking did I see your son. Towards him I made, but he was ware of me and stole into the covert of the wood. 
I, measuring his affections by my own, which then most sought were most might not be found, being one too many by my weary self, pursued my humour, not pursuing his, and gladly shunned who gladly fled from me. Montague. Many a morning hath he there been seen, with tears augmenting the fresh morning's dew, adding to clouds more clouds with his deep sighs. But all so soon as the all-cheering sun should in the farthest east be to draw the shady curtains from Aurora's bed. Away from light steals home my heavy son, and private in his chamber pens himself, shut up his windows, locks fair daylight, and makes himself an artificial night. Black and portentous must this humour prove, unless good counsel may the cause remove. Benvolio. My noble uncle, do you know the cause? Montague. I neither know it nor can learn of him. Benvolio. Have you importuned him by any means? Montague. Both by myself and many other friend, but he, his own affection's counsellor, is to himself, I will not say how true, but to himself so secret and so close, so far from sounding and discovery, as is the bud bit with an envious worm, ere he can spread his sweet leaves to the air, or dedicate his beauty to the sun. Could we but learn from whence his sorrows grow, we would as willingly give cure as no. Enter Romeo. Benvolio. See where he comes. So please you step aside. I'll know his grievance, or be much denied. Montague. I would thou wert so happy by thy stay to hear true shrift. Come, madam, let's away. Exunt, Montague and wife. Benvolio. Good morrow, cousin. Romeo. It's the day so young. Benvolio. But new struck nine. Romeo. Ay, me. Sad hours seem long. Was that my father that went hence so fast? Benvolio. It was. What sadness lengthens Romeo's hours? Romeo. Not having that which having makes them short. Benvolio. In love? Romeo. Out. Benvolio. Of love? Romeo. Out of her favor where I am in love. Benvolio. Alas, that love, so gentle in his view, should be so tyrannous and rough in proof. Romeo. Alas, that love, whose view is muffled still, should without eyes see pathways to his will. Where shall we dine? Oh, me, what fray was here? Yet tell me not, for I have heard it all. Here's much to do with hate, but more with love. Why then, O oh, brawling love, O oh, loving hate? O oh, anything of nothing first create! O oh, heavy lightness, serious vanity, misshapen chaos of well-seeming forms, feather of lead, bright smoke, cold fire, sick health, still waking sleep, that is not what it is, this love feel I, that feel no love in this. Dost thou not laugh? Benvolio. No, cuz, I rather weep. Romeo. Good heart, at what? Benvolio. At thy good heart's oppression. Romeo. Why, such is love's transgression. Griefs of mine own lie heavy in my breast, which thou wilt propagate, to have it pressed with more of thine. This love that thou hast shown doth add more grief to much of mine own. Love is a smoke raised with the fume of sighs. Being purged, a fire sparkling in lovers' eyes. Being vexed, a sea nourished with lovers' tears. What is it else? A madness most discreet, a choking gall and a preserving sweet. Farewell, my coz. Benvolio. Soft, I will go along, and if you leave me so, you do me wrong. Romeo. Tut, I have lost myself, I am not here. 
This is not Romeo, he's some other where. Benvolio, tell me in sadness, who is that you love? Romeo, what, shall I groan and tell thee? Benvolio, groan, why, no, but sadly tell me who. Romeo, bid a sick man in sadness make his will. Ah, word ill urged to one that is so ill. In sadness, cousin, I do love a woman. Benvolio, I aimed so near when I supposed you loved. Romeo, a right good markman, and she's fair I love. Benvolio, a right fair mark, fair cuz, is soonest hit. Romeo, well, in that hit you miss. She'll not be hit with Cupid's arrow. She hath Dian's wit, and, in strong proof of chastity, well armed, from love's weak childish bow she lives unharmed. She will not stay the siege of loving terms, nor bide the encounter of assailing eyes, nor ope her lap to saint-seducing gold. Oh, she's rich in beauty, only poor that, when she dies, with beauty dies her store. Benvolio. Then she hath sworn that she will still live chaste? Romeo, she hath, and in that sparing makes huge waste, for beauty starved with her severity cuts beauty off from all posterity. She is too fair, too wise, wisely too fair, to merit bliss by making me despair. She hath forth sworn to love, and in that vow do I live dead that live to tell it now. Benvolio, be ruled by me, forget to think of her. Romeo, oh, teach me how I should forget to think. Benvolio, by giving liberty unto thine eyes. Examine other beauties. Romeo, tis the way to call hers. Exquisite, and question more. These happy masks that kiss fair ladies' brows, being black, puts us in mind they hide the fair. He that is struck and blind cannot forget the precious treasure of his eyesight lost. Show me a mistress that is passing fair. What doth her beauty serve but as a note where I may read who passed that passing fair? Farewell. Thou canst not teach me to forget. Benvolio. I'll pay that doctrine, or else die in debt. Exeunt. Scene two. A street. Enter Capulet. County Paris, and servant, the clown. Capulet. But Montague is bound as well as I, and penalty alike, and tis not hard, I think, for men so old as we to keep the peace. Paris. Of honorable reckoning are you both, and pity tis you lived at odds so long. But now, my lord, what say you to my suit? Capulet. But saying o'er what I have said before, my child is yet a stranger in the world. She hath not seen the change of fourteen years. Let two more summers wither in their pride, ere we may think her ripe to be a bride. Paris. Younger than she are happy mothers made. Capulet. And too soon marred are those so early made. The earth hath swallowed all my hopes but she. She is the hopeful lady of my earth. But woo her, gentle Paris, get her heart. My will to her consent is but a part, And she agree within her scope of choice Lies my consent and fair according voice. This night I hold an old accustomed feast, Whereto I have invited many a guest, Such as I love, and you among the store. One more, most welcome, makes my number more. At my poor house look to behold this night, Earth-treading stars that make dark heaven light, Such comfort as do lusty young men feel When well-appareled April on the heel Of limping winter treads, Even such delight Among fresh female buds Shall you this night inherit at my house. Hear all, all see, And like her most, whose merit most shall be, Which, on more view of many, Mine being one, may stand in number, though in reckoning none. 
Come, go with me. To servant, giving him a paper. Go, sirrah, trudge about, through fair Verona. Find those persons out, whose names are written there, and to them say, My house, and welcome on their pleasure stay. Exunt Capulet in Paris. Servant. Find them out whose names are written here? It is written that the shoemaker should meddle with his yard, and the tailor with his last, the fisher with his pencil, and the painter with his nets. But I am sent to find those persons whose names are here writ, and can never find what names the writing person hath here writ. I must to the learned. In good time. Enter Benvolio and Romeo. Benvolio. Tut, man! One fire burns out another's burning. One pain is lessened by another's anguish. Turn giddy, and be hope by backward turning. One desperate grief cures with another's languish. Take thou some new infection to thy eye, and the rank poison of the old will die. Romeo. Your plantain leaf is excellent for that. Benvolio. For what, I pray thee? Romeo. For your broken shin. Benvolio. Why, Romeo, art thou mad? Romeo. Not mad, but bound more than a madman is. Shut up in prison, kept without my food, whipped and tormented and godden, good fellow. Servant. God gigodden, I pray, sir. Can you read? Romeo. Ay, mine own fortune in my misery. Servant. Perhaps you have learned it without book, but I pray, can you read anything you see? Romeo. Ay, if I know the letters and the language. Servant. Ye say honestly, rest you merry. Romeo. Stay, fellow, I can read. He reads. Signor Martino and his wife and daughters, County Anselmo and his beauteous sisters, the lady widow of Vitruvio, Signor Placiento and his lovely nieces, Mercutio and his brother Valentine, mine uncle Capulet, his wife and daughters, my fair niece Rosaline and Livia, Signor Valencio and his cousin Tybalt, Lucio and the lively Helena, gives back the paper. A fair assembly. Whither should they come? Servant. Up. Romeo. Whither? Servant. To supper. To our house. Romeo. Whose house? Servant. My master's. Romeo. Indeed, I should have asked you that before. Servant. Now I'll tell you without asking. My master is the great rich Capulet, and if you be not of the house of Montagues, I pray come and crush a cup of wine. Rest you merry. Exit. Benvolio. At this same ancient feast of Capulets sups the fair Rosaline, whom thou so lovest, with all the admired beauties of Verona. Go thither, and with unattained eye compare her face with some that I shall show, and I will make thee think thy swan a crow. Romeo, when the devout religion of mine eye maintains such falsehood, then turn tears to fires, and these who often drowned could never die. Transparent heretics be burnt for liars, one fairer than my love. The all-seeing sun ne'er saw her match since first the world begun. Benvolio, tut, you saw her fair, none else being by herself poised with herself in either eye. But in that crystal scales let there be weighed your lady's love against some other maid that I will show you shining at this feast, and she shall scant show well that now seems best. Romeo. I'll go along. No such sight to be shown, but to rejoice in splendor of my own. Exeunt. Scene 3. Capulet's House. Enter Capulet's wife and nurse. Wife. Nurse, where's my daughter? Call her forth to me. Nurse. Now by my maidenhead at twelve year old, I bade her come. What, lamb? What ladybird? 
God forbid, where's this girl? What, Juliet? Enter Juliet. Juliet. How now? Who calls? Nurse. Your mother. Juliet. Madam, I am here. What is your will? Wife. This is the matter. Nurse, give leave a while. We must talk in secret. Nurse, come back again. I have remembered me. Thou's here our counsel. Thou knowest my daughters of a pretty age. Nurse. Faith, I can tell her age unto an hour. Wife. She's not fourteen. Nurse. I'll lay fourteen of my teeth, and yet to my teen be it spoken. I have but four. She is not fourteen. How long is it now to Lammas died? Wife. A fortnight and odd days. Nurse. Even or odd, of all days in the year, come Lammas Eve at night, shall she be fourteen, Susan and she, God rest all Christian souls, were of an age, while Susan is with God. She was too good for me, but as I said, on Lammas Eve at night shall she be fourteen, that shall she marry. I remember it well, tis since the earthquake now eleven years, and she was weaned, I never shall forget it, of all the days of the year upon that day, for I had then laid wormwood to my dug, sitting in the sun under the dove-house wall. My lord and you were then at Mantua. Nay, I do bear a brain. But as I said, when it did taste the wormwood on the nipple of my dug, and felt it bitter, pretty fool, to see it tetchy and fall out with the dug, shake, quoth the dove-house, "'Twas no need. "'I trow to bid me trudge, "'and since that time it is eleven years, "'for then she could stand high lone, "'nay, by the rood, "'she could have run and waddled all about, "'for even the day before she broke her brow. "'And then my husband, "'God be with his soul, I was a merry man, "'took up the child. "'Yea,' quoth he, "'dost thou fall upon thy face?' Thou wilt fall backward when thou hast more wit. Wilt thou not, Jewel? And by my holodem the pretty wretch left crying and said, Ay, to see now how a jest shall come about, I warrant, and I should live a thousand years. I never should forget it. Wilt thou not, Jewel? quoth he. And pretty fool, it stinted and said, Ay. Wife, enough of this. I pray thee hold thy peace. Nurse, yes, madam, yet I cannot choose but laugh to think it should leave crying and say, I, and yet I warrant it bad upon it brow, a bump as big as a young cockerel stone, a perilous knock, and it cried bitterly, Yea, quoth my husband, fallst upon thy face? Thou wilt fall backward when thou comest to age, wilt thou not, Jewel? It stinted and said, I, Juliet. And stint thou too, I pray thee, nurse, say I. Nurse. Peace, I have done. God mark thee to his grace. Thou wast the prettiest babe that e'er I nursed, And I might live to see thee married once. I have my wish. Wife. Mary, that Mary is the very theme I came to talk of. Tell me, daughter Juliet, how stands your disposition to be married? Juliet, it is an honor that I dream not of. Nurse, an honor? Were not I thine only nurse, I would say thou hadst sucked wisdom from thy teat. Wife, well, think of marriage now. Younger than you, here in Verona, ladies of esteem, are made already mothers. By my count, I was your mother much upon these years that you are now a maid. Thus then in brief, the valiant Paris seeks you for his love. Nurse. A man, young lady? Lady, such a man as all the world. Why, he's a man of wax. Wife. Verona's summer hath not such a flower. Nurse. Nay, he's a flower, in faith a very flower. Wife, what say you? Can you 
love the gentleman? This night you shall behold him at our feast. Read o'er the volume of young Paris's face, and find the light writ there with beauty's pen. Examine every married liniment, and see how one another lends content. And what obscured in this fair volume lies, find written in the margin of his eyes, this precious book of love, this unbound lover, to beautify him only lacks a cover. The fish lives in the sea, and tis much pride, for fair without the fair within to hide. That book in many's eyes doth share the glory, that in gold clasps locks and the golden story. So shall you share all that he doth possess, by having him making yourself no less. Nurse. No less? Nay, bigger. Women grow by men. Wife. Speak briefly. Can you like of Paris's love? Juliet. I'll look to like, if looking liking move. But no more deep will I in dart mine eye than your consent give strength to make it fly. Enter Serving Man. Serving Man. Madam, the guests are come, supper served up. You called, my young lady asked for, the nurse cursed in the pantry, and everything in extremity. I must hence to wait, I beseech you follow straight. Wife, we follow thee. Exit, serving man. Juliet, the county stays. Nurse, go, girl, seek happy nights to happy days. Exit. Scene four, a street. Enter Romeo, Mercutio, Benvolio, with five or six other maskers, torchbearers. Romeo, what? Shall this speech be spoke for our excuse, or shall we on without apology? Benvolio. The date is out of such prolixity. We'll have no Cupid hoodwinked with a scarf, bearing a tartar's painted bow of lath, scaring the ladies like a crow-keeper, nor no without-book prologue faintly spoke after the prompter for our entrance. But let them measure us by what they will. We'll measure them a measure, and be gone. Romeo. Give me a torch. I am not for this ambling. Being but heavy, I will bear the light. Mercutio. Nay, gentle Romeo, we must have you dance. Romeo. Not I, believe me. You have dancing shoes. With nimble soles, I have a soul of lead. So stakes me to the ground I cannot move. Mercutio. You are a lover. Borrow Cupid's wings and soar with them above a common bound. Romeo. I am too sore and pierced with his shaft to soar with his light feathers, and so bound I cannot bound a pitch above dull woe. Under love's heavy burthen do I sink. Mercutio. And to sink in it, should you burthen love, too great oppression for a tender thing? Romeo. Is love a tender thing? It is too rough, too rude, too boisterous, and it pricks like thorn. Mercutio. If love be rough with you, be rough with love. Prick love for pricking, and you beat love down. Give me a case to put my visage in, a visor for a visor. What care I? What curious eye doth quote deformities? Here are the beetle brows shall blush for me. Benvolio, come, knock and enter, and no sooner in, but every man betake him to his legs. Romeo, a torch for me. Let wanton's light of heart tickle the senseless rushes with their heels, for I am proverbed with a grandsire phrase. I'll be a candle-holder and look on. The game was ne'er so fair, and I am done. Mercutio. Tut, done's the mouse, the constable's own word. If thou art done, we'll draw thee from the mire of this sir reverence love, wherein thou stick'st up to the ears. Come, we burn daylight, 
Ho! Oh. Romeo. Nay, that's not so. Mercutio. I mean, sir, in delay. We waste our lights in vain, like lamps by day. Take our good meaning, for our judgment sits five times in that, ere once in our five wits. Romeo. And we mean well in going to this mask, but tis no wit to go. Mercutio. Why, may one ask? Romeo. I dreamt a dream to-night. Mercutio. And so did I. Romeo. Well, what was yours? Mercutio. That dreamers often lie. Romeo. In bed asleep, while they do dream things true. Mercutio. Oh, then I see Queen Mab hath been with you. She is the fairy's midwife, and she comes in shape no bigger than an agate stone on the forefinger of an alderman, drawn with a team of little atomies, athwart's men's noses as they lie asleep. Her wagon spokes made of long spinner's legs, the cover of the wings of grasshoppers, her traces of the smallest spider's web, her collars of the moonshine's watery beam. Her whip of cricket's bone, the lash of film. Her wagoner, a small gray-coated gnat. Not half so big as a round little worm pricked from the lazy finger of a maid. Her chariot is an empty hazel nut made by the joiner squirrel or old grub. Time out a mind the fairy's coachmakers. And in this state she gallops night by night through lovers' brains, and then they dream of love. Or courtiers' knees that dream on curses straight, or lawyers' fingers who straight dream on fees, or ladies' lips who straight on kisses dream, which oft the angry mab with blisters plagues because their breaths with sweetmeats tainted are. Sometimes she gallops o'er a courtier's nose, and then dreams he of smelling out a suit and sometime comes she with a tithe-pig's tail, tickling a parson's nose as a lies asleep. Then dreams he of another benefice. Sometimes she driveth o'er a soldier's neck, and then dreams he of cutting foreign throats, of breeches, ambuscados, Spanish blades, of healths five fathom deep, and then anon drums in his ear, at which he starts and wakes, and being thus frightened, swears a prayer or two and sleeps again. This is that very mab that plats the manes of horses in the night, and bakes the elf-locks in foul, sluttish hairs, which one untangled much misfortune bodes. This is the hag, when maids lie on their backs, that presses them and learns them first to bear, making them women of good carriage. This is she... Romeo, peace, peace, Mercutio, peace, thou talk'st of nothing. Mercutio, true, I talk of dreams, which are the children of an idle brain, begot of nothing but vain fantasy, which is as thin of substance as the air, and more inconstant than the wind, who woos even now the frozen bosoms of the north, and, being angered, puffs away from thence turning his face to the dew-dropping south. Benvolio. This wind you talk of blows us from ourselves. Supper is done, and we shall come too late. Romeo. I fear too early, for my mind misgives some consequence. Yet hanging in the stars shall bitterly begin his fearful date with this night's revels and expire the term of a despised life, closed in my breast, by some vile forfeit of untimely death. But he that hath the steerage of my course direct my sail. On, lusty gentlemen! Benvolio. Strike, drum! They march about the stage. Exunt. Scene five. Capulet's house. Serving men come forth with napkins. First servant. Where's Potpan that he helps not to take away? He shift a trencher, he scrape a trencher. Second servant. 
when good manners shall lie all in one or two men's hands and they unwashed too tis a foul thing first servant away with the join stools remove the court cupboard look to the plate good thou save me a piece of march pane and as thou lovest me let the porter let in susan grindstone and nell anthony and potpan second servant ay boy ready first servant you are looked for and called for asked for and sought for in the great chamber third servant we cannot be here and there too cheerly boys be brisk a while and the longer liver take all exeunt enter the maskers enter with servants capulet his wife juliet tybalt and all the guests and gentlewomen to the maskers capulet welcome gentlemen ladies that have their toes unplagued with corns will have a bout with you aha my mistresses which of you all will now deny to dance she that makes dainty she i'll swear hath corns am i come near ye now welcome gentlemen i have seen the day that i have worn a visor and could tell a whispering tale in a fair lady's ear such as would please tis gone tis gone tis gone you are welcome gentlemen come musicians play a hall a hall give room and foot it girls music plays and they dance more light you knaves and turn the tables up and quench the fire the room is grown too hot ah sirrah this unlooked-for sport comes well nay sit nay sit good cousin capulet for you and i are past our dancing days how long is it now since last yourself and i were in a mask second capulet by our lady thirty years capulet what man tis not so much tis not so much tis since the nuptial of lucentio come pentecost as quickly as it will some five-and-twenty years and then we masked second capulet tis more tis more his son is elder sir his son is thirty capulet will you tell me that his son was but a ward two years ago romeo to a serving man what lady's that which doth enrich the hand of yonder knight serving man i know not sir romeo oh she doth teach the torches to burn bright it seems she hangs upon the cheek of night like a rich jewel in an ethiop's ear beauty too rich for use for earth too dear so shows a snowy dove trooping with crows as yonder lady o'er her fellows shows the measure done i'll watch her place of stand and touching hers make blessed my rude hand did my heart love till now forswear at sight for i ne'er saw true beauty till this night tybalt this by his voice should be a montague fetch me my rapier boy what dares the slave come hither covered with an antic face to fleer and scorn at our solemnity now by the stock and honour of my kin to strike him dead i hold it not a sin capulet why how now kinsman wherefore storm you so tybalt uncle this is a montague our foe a villain that is hither come in spite to scorn at our solemnity this night capulet young romeo is it tybalt tis he that villain romeo capulet content thee gentle cuz let him alone abears him like a portly gentleman and to say truth verona brags of him to be a virtuous and well-governed youth i would not for the wealth of all this town here in my house do him disparagement therefore be patient take no note of him it is my will the which if thou respect show a fair presence and put off these frowns an ill-beseeming semblance for a feast tybalt it fits when such a villain is a guest i'll not endure him capulet 
he shall be endured. What, Goodman boy? I say he shall. Go to! Am I the master here, or you? Go to! You'll not endure him. God shall mend my soul. You'll make a mutiny among my guests. You will set cock a hoop. You'll be the man. Tybalt. Why, uncle, tis a shame. Capulet. Go to, go to, you are a saucy boy. Is it so indeed? This trick may chance to scathe you, I know what. You must contrary me. Marry tis time. Well said, my hearts. You are a prince, Cox. Go. Be quiet, or more light, more light. For shame, I'll make you quiet. What? Cheerly, my hearts. Tybalt. Patience perforce, with willful collar meeting, makes my flesh tremble in their different greeting. I will withdraw, but this intrusion shall, no seeming sweet, convert to bitterest gall. Exit. Romeo. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, the gentle fine is this. My lips to blushing pilgrims ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. Juliet. Good pilgrim, you do wrong your hand too much, which mannerly devotion shows in this. For saints have hands that pilgrims' hands do touch, and palm to palm is holy palmer's kiss. Romeo. Have not saints' lips, and holy palmer's too? Juliet. Ay, pilgrim, lips that they must use in prayer. Romeo. O oh, then, dear saint, let lips do what hands do. They pray, grant thou, lest faith turn to despair. Juliet. Saints do not move, though grant for prayer's sake. Romeo. Then move not while my prayer's effect I take. Thus from my lips by thine my sin is purged. Kisses her. Juliet. Then have my lips the sin that they have took. Romeo. Sin from my lips? O oh, trespass sweetly urged, give me my sin again. Kisses her. Juliet. You kiss by the book? Nurse. Madam, your mother craves a word with you. Romeo. What is her mother? Nurse. Mary, bachelor, her mother is the lady of the house, and a good lady, and a wise and virtuous. I nursed her daughter that you talked with all. I tell you, he that can lay hold of her shall have the chinks. Romeo. Is she a Capulet? Oh, dear account! My life is my foe's debt. Benvolio. Away, be gone, the sport is at the best. Romeo. Ay, so I fear, the more is my unrest. Capulet. Nay, gentlemen, prepare not to be gone. We have a trifling foolish banquet towards. Is it e'en so? Why, then, I thank you all. I thank you, honest gentlemen. Good night. More torches here. Exunt maskers. Come on, then. Let's to bed. Ah, sirrah, by my fay, it waxes late. All to my rest. Exunt. All but Juliet and nurse. Juliet. Come hither, nurse. What is yon gentleman? Nurse. The son and heir of old Tiberio. Juliet. What's he that now is going out of door? Nurse. Mary, that I think, be young Petruchio. Juliet. What's he that follows there that would not dance? Nurse. I know not. Juliet. Go ask his name if he be married. My grave is like to be my wedding bed. Nurse. His name is Romeo and a Montague, the only son of your great enemy. Juliet. My only love? Sprung from my only hate? Too early seen unknown and known too late. Prodigious birth of love, it is to me that I must love a loathed enemy? Nurse. What's this? What's this? 
Juliet. A rhyme I learnt even now, of one I danced with all. One calls within, Juliet! Nurse. Anon, anon! Come, let's away! The strangers all are gone. Exunt. End of Act One.